Hello, welcome back to my studio. I'm so happy that you are here. Uh, we're back. We had, you know, a little break, um, but now we're back in the new year, back to getting creative, getting work done. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, today we have a very special live stream. I am going to critique your work. Uh, if you have submitted anything to Artist Academy website, uh, they have a gallery there. Um, check it out if you haven't already. The, you can see what people are creating uh, that are also, you know, look, watching the videos and learning new techniques and skills. Um, and so they can upload their work and I have collected some of them to take a look at and comment on and, you know, see what you can improve on and, and see what's working and, and, you know, just kind of give you some feedback. So, uh, as always, if you have any questions and comments, please feel free to ask and I will address them as I can. Um, but in the meantime, let's get to it. So if you have, are familiar with the Artists Academy website, um, you can go to the show us your project and you can see all of these images and there's pages and pages of your guys's work, which is awesome. So uh, I'm just going to kind of pick and choose through and um, talk about what is working and what is not. And hopefully we can have a, a good discussion on, on what you guys are learning and, and what we can improve on. And um, again, questions, please let me know. And uh, if you have any comments on my critiques or whatever, please feel free to let me know. I'm here. Okay, so I picked this one because this is a very ambitious piece, which I love. I mean, push your skills, right? And this one is really, really nice. You have two light sources, a warm and a cool. Um, and that in and, in and of itself is difficult. <laughs> so good on this person for going for it. So I do like that he has this cast, very classical. Um, the study is, is using a cast uh, so that you can have a full value range, uh, the white plaster, and then the light source as it turns in space, you know, can get you a full value range, uh, which will help you understand form, you know. Uh, so using a plaster cast is super, super classic, which I love. Uh, so he has, he or she, I think this is uh, David, yeah. Uh, this gentleman has lit, lit it with two light sources uh, from opposite sides. And again, that is really, really difficult because you are blowing out a lot of your shadows, which a lot of artists like to kind of utilize for describing form and space, um, but he is figuring out ways to make it work uh, with the warms and cools of the light uh, to still explain form, uh, which is so ambitious. I've never done a two light, uh, especially warm and two warm and cool light source uh, still life. So I love that David here is going for it. Um, so things that are working, he is obviously describing form, definitely describing form. Uh, I can feel the turning of this head. The proportions look really great. The gesture looks really great. Um, he, he's figuring out the cools in, you know, the, the lights here, um, in the shadows and whatever, and then the warms in the shadows as well. Uh, again, this, this is a very complex scene. Uh, and without seeing the setup, I can't say specifically what, you know, he he may improve on for that specific scene. But from my general observation, uh, he is getting some really great uh, proportion and gesture placement, things like that. Some things that could be improved on a bit. Um, the clavicle here is a bit overly explained here. So the values are a bit overly explained here in the shadows. Um, and then 
the clavicle attaches here in the shoulder and I feel like he's just extended it and then cut it short a little bit. So this little notch right here should be coming about right there instead of over here. It's a small, small thing. I understand that is so small, but it's things like that that will immediately elevate your drawing and understanding of anatomy and believability of your piece in general. Um, so the same thing that's happening here with the clavicle is happening here with the pectoralis major. It's just a little too dark of a shadow for that particular area. Um, if you just lightened it a bit, uh, and as it comes up here into the neck, you can see that the neck, uh, I guess, form, <laughs> shape, uh, plane, that's the word I'm looking for, plane, is going this way. And then the, the chest, the pecs, are going this way. So the same value can't be here as it is here. Um, obviously, this is going to be catching some reflected light, but on the whole, this is going to be getting more light, more direct light than this is. So I would say that this probably needs to come up in value a bit and just be a bit more subtle in the way that uh, you're describing that turning into the, the cooler shadows there. Um, okay, down here at this bowl, I love that this bowl feels like it is in front of that plaster cast. That's really, really strong. Um, what I'm not loving is that this edge here of the bowl is not lining up with the inside edge of the bowl. I feel like it needs to come out just a bit and then meet back up. And then if I follow this ellipse over, right, then the side of this bowl, this bowl over here, that side should meet up just kind of visually in space right and so that also tells me that this side needs to come out hopefully you can see that um oh kelsey says the colors in this are inviting rich colors bring in interest yes that's true i i love <laughs> seriously i do love this piece i love that david just went for it and he just he used all of his skills to get this done and good on him man I really am pleased with it. Um, but it's just these little things that are going to really elevate the piece a bit more. Um, and the other thing is this branch, I feel like is not quite making sense with the rest of the composition. So if he had moved it in more or, you know, put it in the bowl, just kind of relating more to the overall piece, overall um, composition, the objects, then it would have been more successful. But it's just kind of over here on its own, you know, it's not relating very well to the rest of the objects in here. So um, when you are setting up your still lifes, take a step back and try a few things and take a picture actually with your phone that will bring the the piece in or the setup into thumbnail and you will automatically see some uh, issues that you can kind of work out. Um, but don't be afraid to just work at a setup for a day or two or three. Uh, I definitely have. Uh, if you want to get it right, you need to allow yourself the time um, to just get it right. Uh, instead of having to figure it out on the canvas, you get it right from the get-go in the setup. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but good job, David. Really, I am very, very, very pleased. So this one is called Forgotten Heroes, so study in the color of light. So that's awesome. Okay, let's find another piece. Um, I have looked through these previously, at least, you know, some of them. So I have some that I definitely wanted to comment on. Let's zoom in on this guy. This is another very complicated piece, but good on, who is this? This is Carol um, in Adelaide. So she is one of our friends in Australia. Hopefully I can get this whole thing in. There we go. Okay. So 
Good job, Carol. This is, again, another very ambitious piece, um, but you are going for it. And so well done. Uh, so the thing that immediately catches me with this piece is the value control. Um, so obviously this tree is in shadow and you have uh, the light source coming from behind the tree. So when that happens, your shadows are going to have to be very compressed and very subtle. So what you're doing is you're making these deep, dark shadows black, and then these shadows here the, of the turning form are just jumping out a little too far from that black. Um, and then with the leaves, I'm sure that these were very dark leaves, uh, but the highlights that you have through here are just a little too bright. Um, Lexi says the greens are great, but it looks like it needs some contrast colors. I, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that to an extent. Um, this could work. It really could. Uh, I would think that the greens here would probably be more yellowy, especially with uh, the sunlight, I'm assuming sunlight, um, coming through those leaves. They tend to be pretty bright, yellow green. Um, and then these would just need to really quiet down in terms of value contrast and color contrast. Um, and then same thing through here. It feels like there is another light source, kind of subtle light source, I guess, that's coming through here, but I don't think that there actually is, or it's not being explained properly if there is. So these leaves through here are a bit too bright. This through here is a bit too bright. So a nice glaze over everything would immediately calm everything down and bring it more um, to an understandable middle than kind of the extreme contrast that's going on, especially these roots through here. They are definitely over explained. I would guess that this was done from a photograph. I could be wrong, but I would guess it's done from a photograph. And the photograph uh, tends to compress values more. Um, so these roots and things probably did look more contrasty in, in the reference. Um, but that's one of the problems with using photography is that you have to compensate in the work itself um, to overcome that that issue with the photograph um, but she's getting some good depth here which is awesome and seriously this is not an easy subject at all so carol you you went for it and i'm i'm really glad that you did because it looks awesome um, it's it's a very strong piece just a little more constrained in your values and colors um, and one of the ways that you can do that is by squinting. Squinting is seriously one of the easiest and most efficient ways to get your colors and values to harmonize better um, because it takes out a lot of the light from your eyes and you are seeing those big shapes. Um, so you can see how these big shapes of the tree in general work together and how these leaves on top of that tree, how close they are in value. So, um, yeah, good job, Carol. That's that's awesome. Let's find another piece. These are, let's see this one here. Karen here looks like a Hawaii sunset. That's awesome. I've never been to Hawaii, but holy moly, look how beautiful. So she has... A little bit more into frame. There we go. She's gotten some great depth through here. Uh, I think that it could probably be pushed a little bit farther. Um, so she has the kind of more cobalt blue here of the distant mountain, right? And as it comes up, it gets more vibrant and uh, you can see the, the form of the mountains better, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that she could have simplified more through here, but she put in a lot of work. <laughs> Seriously, this is a lot of work, uh, especially down through here. Um, but again, I think that just simplifying a bit more through here would not only give her more depth in the piece itself, um, it would have just visually been more comfortable. 
Um, and then I think making, bringing the kind of lighter blue, make this a bit lighter than it is, and then bring those blues through here so that these colors and, and values through here can really, really sing. Um, this tree, holy moly, is a lot of, <laughs> a lot of fine, fine work. Um, this is not something that I would tackle. So I am impressed that she took the time and energy and really went for it. I'm, I'm always surprised when people choose subjects like this because it is so far away from what I tend to choose that it's inspiring really like why why would i shy away from this subject i shouldn't so good job um i think again just simplifying a bit more she has gone through and explained every leaf every flower every branch every thing right and just simplifying a bit more so that this can be the focus instead of kind of coming down here and observing every little thing um, that is going on in here. Um, Kelsey is asking, what does she use to make it look foggy? Uh, so that's going to be a value thing. Um, you can also do glazes over the piece. Um, yeah, so it's going to be, and, and maybe over here, it's probably some glare from a window or light source, I guess I should say. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of things, but this looks to be, this blue over here looks to be more glare than actual color on the piece. Uh, and then this is, yeah, that's, that's just paint. Um, so yeah, if you are looking to create some more distance or fog or whatever, um, I tend to use glazes and such for that or scumbling I guess it would be uh, when you're doing it with white so I kind of get my piece working and then I would come back over and if I need to push the atmosphere a bit more then I'll I'll just scumble over with some some white and whatever color I need to usually a cobalt or blue of some sort um, will do the trick um Kelsey again says, reminds me of a detailed children's book illustration. Yeah, it's it's really, really cool. And this actually would work really well in <laughs> a children's book. You're absolutely right, Kelsey. Um, it's really, really interesting. So good job, Karen. Uh, this is so inspiring, um, truly. I have definitely seen worse um, attempts at a, a Hawaiian scene and worse, worse children's book <laughs> illustrations. So I don't know if that's what you were going for, Karen, but uh, this really is a, a really nice piece. And if it is something that you experienced in life, then it's a good keepsake from that experience. So very cool. Let's find something else. Um, okay, so this is a, a master copy. Let's pull it up and and see what we got going on. Let's see, it's a little too big, but okay. So yeah, this is a master copy, um, which I highly recommend. You do, if you can find some good prints of a masterwork that you like, um, go for it. <laughs> I I think that that is one of the best ways to improve your own skills is to cap is to copy a master work. Um, so this person, let's see who is this. This is Mariah. Um, has chosen a very classic subject of Mary and Jesus, and obviously a Renaissance period uh, piece. So she has done a really good job of observing the overall. Uh, poses and gestures, etc. Um, there are some issues with the proportions and anatomy. This hand in general is not very convincing. Um, the placement of these eyes, this one is higher than this one. And the nose feels really big for where the mouth and chin are. Um, and then 
Jesus here, this hand into the wrist is not quite feeling right. I would think that this is a bit too wide. Um, and then I'm questioning the length from the wrist to the elbow there. But without having the original painting, I can't say specifically like, yeah, this is what needs to change and improve and whatever. Um, I think it's great that she is doing a master copy. So good on her. Uh, Chanel is asking self-taught here, what is a master copy? Well, there you go. That <laughs> Let's talk about it. So a master copy is when you find a piece uh, done by a master artist that you really enjoy. Um, I would suggest doing something a bit more on the simple side than, I don't know, like an Albert Bierstadt where he has grand, massive, complex landscape scenes. I would, you know, maybe a portrait or a still life or whatever. Um, if you find something that you like done by a, a master artist, uh, usually I prefer like 19th century artists personally, but everyone has their own preferences in terms of what they like. Um, find a good copy of that. It could be online. Uh, I know that the Getty has tons of images and you can probably find some good paintings on there. Uh, and then you just try to copy it as best as you can um, with whatever medium, whatever process, you know, you just try to get it as close as you can through your own means. Um, and you will find that copying their decisions and their work is very, very valuable to understanding form and value control and color and handling. It's incredibly, incredibly useful. So Chanel, I do recommend you do some master copies to start researching some artists that kind of catch your eye and copy their work. Um, yeah. So good job, Mariah. I, Mariah, I keep saying Mariah, it's Maria. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's Maria. <laughs> um, yeah, so good job. That's that's awesome. Um, the, the values, too, I would guess need a little bit of work. I would think that these portraits in particular, and really the lights in general, would probably come up in value a bit more uh, to describe a bit more form instead of just flat shapes. So good job, Maria. Um, what else do we have? Let's pull up this guy. This is Michelle. Hang time in watercolor. <laughs> so watercolor, I struggle with a lot. So anyone who decides to use watercolor, I have immediate respect for. It's a little too chaotic for my taste. Um, that's why I use oil because I can control everything about it. <laughs> Where watercolor, you have to allow it to be free in order for it to be the best that it can be. So Michelle here um, did an excellent job of controlling the watercolor in certain areas and letting it flow free in other areas. Uh, so obviously these clouds, she has allowed it to do its thing, but then she was con more controlled about it here and in some of these, you know, areas there. So awesome, awesome job. Um, and then down here, I feel like there, the light is probably pretty dappled through here. So that's why you have this really beautiful cad yellow. And then, you know, it's coming into the greens here. I think that probably these greens could come down in value more to explain that dappled light a bit more, especially where you have these light rays through here. You can see that she's trying to get that light to uh, make sense and kind of be conveyed through there. Uh, but this unfortunately is too close of a value to what's going on next to it that it's not reading as that bright, bright light. Um, and then uh, yeah, for the, the kind of rolling hills that are going through here, I think that this value of these this green to this value is just a little too separated. Um, so yeah, for that dappled light, you just kind of need, you need to simplify. 
um, and then you will need to see exactly how close uh, values uh, like these shadows are to the the shadow of the the hay in general um, and then how close of value it is from this to this where it's getting direct light hopefully that makes sense um, and that's again where squinting is really going to come in handy uh, and then the barn back here i think is just pulling a little too much focus the the focus or the subject of the piece seems to be these clouds pretty much right uh, i would say a secondary focus is the the hay down here but the third focus is definitely the last focus is the barn here um, and so i would just simplify that a lot bring down the value simplify um, it doesn't need to be white through here because that's pulling too much contrast so yeah i mean it's great and then she has the receding um horizon line through here you can definitely get some layers which is fantastic truly uh this is an awesome piece and again watercolor is very very difficult <laughs> at least for me so well done michelle okay let's do a couple more here there was, oh, I wanted to just quickly talk about this one because I think it's so cool. Uh, this is Ola, um, yeah, done in gouache, which is not a common medium for people to work with. So immediately I was like, hey, that's awesome. But I just love the vibrancy of this. I think that this person really handled this very, very well. Um, and the fun colors, the the proportions are on point, the gesture is on point, the colors are on point, the form is on point. And so I, I just thought that was a really fun graphic piece. So awesome. Um, <laughs> this painting will decorate any interior. Absolutely. <laughs> so very cool uh, use of gouache. Um, I would think that acrylic would also lend itself very well to this sort of uh, piece. So good job on tackling gouache. Um, oh, yeah, Max says, this is awesome. I would love this as a puzzle. Seriously, that would be an awesome puzzle. Very, very good, <laughs> very good observation. I, I think that's awesome. Um, so I am a floral painter, so this one caught my eye. I think this is a really cool attempt. Um, yeah, this is colored pencil. Karen is just getting back into drawing after a 40-year hiatus. So welcome back, Karen. <laughs> Holy moly, that's awesome. And having the fortitude to get back to it um, is not easy. So very inspiring, Karen. So um, colored pencil, you have to layer a lot in order to get the um, desired effects, I think. Um, she's drawing on vellum, which is a really interesting uh, choice. I've, I've drawn on vellum a long time ago, but I haven't done it recently. So I can't say specifically like, oh, you'll want to do this or you won't want to do this. Um, but I think it's a cool cool uh, surface to draw on. But because it's colored pencil, you're going to be seeing a lot more kind of light coming through the colored pencil. Um, and so getting the darky dark darks is going to be a lot more difficult. So you can see it here, it's supposed to be in shadow, but it's not quite reading as in shadow. Through here, it's not quite reading. Uh, of course, these are brighter and, and whatever and more colorful, um, but I think just simplifying more, like putting just a general color over these shadow areas will help bring these forward even more, um, especially back here. She's layering some cool colors, which is awesome, but the values just aren't quite working yet. And with flowers especially, uh, you have to compress those values to get the 
light play in between the petals. It's a really delicate back and forth dance. Um, and with colored pencil, that's not an easy feat because once you lay it down, it's hard to take back off. Um, so awesome, awesome go at it, Karen. That's, that's awesome. Um, I would just say simplify more, just more simple in your colors, in your values. Um, and other than that, you are going for it and good on you. This is after 40 years, an awesome piece, truly. So well done. Okay. And I hope that you guys take the time to look through these um, and see what everyone is doing. It's so inspiring to see all of these cool images. And no matter how far along someone is in their education and their skills, they are, they're doing it. So, and you know, they're posting for people to see, which is so cool. I still have issues showing people what I'm working on. So the fact that these people are, you know, just a very simple sketch of a boat and a lighthouse in, in her sketchbook. That is awesome, Eileen. Really, I, I love it. Uh, just a very simple lines, you know, just the tiniest bit of shadow work in here. Um, but overall, figuring out that line work and understanding how to make this boat in front of that lighthouse. Fantastic, truly. That is so, so worthy <laughs> of being drawn and, and studied. Um, this is a, a really nice still life. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about it because I think that, well, it's done from life, obviously, uh, which is, always preferable. Um, I'm a still life girl myself, but yeah, so I, I try to work from life with my still lives as absolute much as possible. If I have something perishable that, you know, takes longer to paint than it does to decompose <laughs> and I might use a photograph, but I definitely, definitely recommend with still life, especially work from life. These obviously are not um, items that are going to decompose. So I think that it was a smart choice to pick these items. The composition in general though, I think could use a bit more work. Um, this picture here, or maybe it's a window, I don't know, um, just feels a little too a little too far away to um, be considered part of this scene. Either you need to explain more of it, move it down, maybe a bit more, but it's too disconnected here. This big void through here is just making it not work. So either crop this scene or make this more visible so that it, it makes more sense as a part of the scene. Um, but on the whole, very well observed, this texture through here on that teapot, holy moly. And again, you have the two light sources. Uh, you have this direct light source and then you have the reflected, but I think that there's also maybe a window coming from this way um, because this is definitely not reflected light. That's probably window light. Um, so yeah, you have the two light sources, which is not easy again. Um, and he's trying, I think this is a, yeah, David. I wonder if it's the same David as before. It kind of looks the, like the same. So good job, David. He's, he's working. Good job, David. Um, anyway, so yeah, he's trying to figure out how to make this turn in space. I'm not quite believing this edge as it relates to that side. Um, and so just a little bit more observation, but he has that handle, which is nice. This ellipse is really nice. He's working through that ellipse. And you can see that the inside of the cup here and the outside of the cup line up perfectly. So he got it worked out on this one. Um, but yeah, so overall, really great study. Well done, David. Uh, Maddie asks, what subject would you recommend for a beginner in acrylic? Or still life always the way to start? Still life is the easiest way to start because you don't have a model to pay for um, or schedule around or 
get back into position or, you know, it's, it's a really great way to start because you can just put it up on your, you know, still life stand, whatever it is that is holding it and leave it there and study it for as long as you need to. So if you are um, beginning in acrylic, you're not only figuring out how to use acrylic paint, you're figuring out how to handle your uh, values and your colors and your shapes and, you know, all of these things, you have a lot of things to juggle. And so if you also have to figure out how to get a model back into position properly and how you're going to pay for that model and, and when is going to work properly for that model or, or whatever, um, a still life is just alleviates all of that. So I would either recommend a still life setup or a master copy those would be the best options for you uh, if you are beginning. Um, the other thing that you might want to consider before you jump into paint is go take some time to um, just draw in either pencil or charcoal. Charcoal is very similar to paint in that you have to think very broadly uh, about your um, about your values and, and how you lay down your your strokes um, but pencil is very line based and it you know you have to think more about your shapes and line and, and whatever um, but don't let that dissuade you jump into acrylic if that's what you want to do that's totally fine um, just understand there's a lot to think about when you're beginning to paint and so if it feels a little too overwhelming then you might want to go back and uh, just draw for a while because there is a lot that you can learn just from handling a pencil as you can see here in this eagle done by Susan um, I mean you can describe a lot with pencil and understanding how to get those proportions and gesture and placement um, is going to be a lot easier in pencil than it is in paint so things to think about Maddie um, and of course the videos here on Artist Academy are fantastic at kind of de describing and explaining how to uh, paint and go about things in a in a way that will help you okay so awesome eagle that's that's all that's all this is I think maybe just simplify these feathers a little bit more but I think that she did a great job of really capturing the subject um just minor value issues I think that maybe this beak is a little too I guess over explained with the values it could just simplify that a little bit more with a, a glaze over it you can glaze with pencils just really nice get a hard pencil and you can just go over that really quickly. So yeah, good job, Susan, that's awesome. Okay, let's do one more. Um, this is really nice. I think this is another watercolor. Yeah, that's a watercolor. Sedona Sunrise, awesome. Um, Again, watercolor is so <laughs> unpredictable. So what an awesome subject to tackle. Uh, there's a lot of shapes going on here and layering watercolor is not always easy. So um, Lindy here has done an awesome job of getting the, the cliffs to feel like they are protruding in space, right? Obviously, you have the moon back here, which is really nice, um, and the clouds. I would say, and this is really difficult for me to say because, again, watercolor is not my forte, but I feel like these shadows are a bit too dark, and I feel like it's just a little too contrasty um, for what it needs to be, especially here in the grass. Um, I'm sure that there are color variations in here, but understand if there are value variations. Color and value are different. Um, you can have the different colors, but that are the same value. And so that's where squinting really comes into play. Um, 
and understanding, you know, if they're on the same plane here, they're catching the same light. So even though they're different colors, what are their values? Um, and so kind of same thing through here, very colorful, really fun, but are the values different? And right now this red is very different from this yellow. So yeah, just things to think about while you're painting. Um, it gets very specific, but you have to have paintings like this that you have already done to understand, you know, what can be improved upon and things to think about for the next one. Uh, Kelsey says, thought the same thing about the shadows. I'm focusing on the shadow instead of the cliff face, right? Um, and so that's, that's where the problem comes in. If your values are too contrasty or just not quite working in the way that they need to work, uh, they will tend to automatically take the focus and something will feel uncomfortable. Um, and so that's when, you know, if, if something is feeling un uncomfortable, go through, okay, is it the value? Is it the color? Is it the shape? Um, and it will usually be one of those things. But overall, great effort, very complex subject. So awesome, awesome go at it, Lindy. Okay, so that was that was the critique. Um, hopefully you got something from that. Uh, if you want another critique session in the future and on your specific work, please, please, please not only upload it, um, but let me know. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's fun to critique and it's a ne necessary part of being an artist, not only self critiquing while you're working, but having other artists critique your work is very, very important. Um, and anyone who's been to any sort of art school <laughs> understands that I, I went to the academy and they are very much not kind in their critiques. <laughs> I've had an hour long critique, just ripping me and my work to shreds. So you, you grow a thick skin, right? Um, I don't want to rip anyone to shreds. My goal is just to help get you guys to hone your skills a bit more. Um, and it looks like the, the ones that I picked out, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They are going for it. They are, they're working on things that, um, maybe are a little more than, uh, maybe more than they thought it would be of a project. Um, but they're going for it. And that is awesome. That's, that's how we improve. That's how we grow. And then getting feedback on that is a, another way of how we improve. And so on the next one, you get to do even better. So, uh, let me know if you have any last minute questions, but I hope that that helped you in your own work. Um, and that you can kind of self critique and go through those, um, points, you know, is it value? Is it color? Is it shape? What is uncomfortable in an area? And sometimes you need to put a piece away for a while and then come back to it later. And the solution will be pretty obvious about what needs to happen. Um, so good job, everyone. And uh, thank you for your feedback through this. And uh, I will see you. I'm, I'll be back next week. Uh, we are going to be talking about how to become a professional artist. So if that is your goal, then please join me next week so that we can have a good discussion about that. Okay, thanks so much for joining and I will see you next week.